I'm John Travis in Novato, California on the 12th of June, 2020, talking to Larry Palevsky in New York, um, <clears throat> who I have known the name of for a couple of decades, probably, but we can't figure out when and if we actually physically met, but uh, through our connections with the American Holistic Medical Association. And then I tracked you down the other day and bingo, I've got you. So I want to find out more about who you are and why, uh, what, <clears throat> where you were born, uh, what your parents did uh, that, uh, and your childhood that led you into medicine and then specifically into uh, holism. So let's start with uh, where it all began. Take it away. Sure. Well, I was born in New York in 1961 and uh, grew up in Queens, New York. Uh, for the first 18 years of my life and had a pretty fun childhood playing outside a lot, bike riding, sports, uh, hanging out, going to parties, etc. And um, ended up going to Vassar College in 1979, graduated uh, four years later in 1983 and uh, went to medical school in 1983 at NYU School of Medicine. And it's interesting, Jack, because I never really had any interest as a kid to be a doctor. Um, most, uh, most of my interests were more in political science and uh, law and maybe even theater. Because uh, I did a lot of theater both in high school, junior high school, high school, and uh, every year at summer camps. And uh, when I came back from second year of college and told my parents I was gonna go to medical school, they were a bit stunned because there was, nothing, there was nothing leading up to that that would have said, oh yeah, I want to be a doctor. So it was one of those uh, divine interventions, I think. And uh, I went to NYU School of Medicine, did four years there, and then did a three-year pediatric residency at Mount Sinai in New York from 1987 to 1990. Can you say more specifics of what led to your conversion to the, the, the faith, as it were? Oh, it's, it, it wasn't a conversion. It was literally a divine intervention. Um, I remember in freshman year of college, um, I was sure I was going to go to law school. I was going to study to be a lawyer. And I saw the movie and Justice for All with Al Pacino. This was 1979, 1980. And I sat there. And for some reason, that movie became, that's what law is like. And I said, I can't be a lawyer. That's too unethical. I had, you know, very strong ethics and morals. I had very strong, uh, strong dad when it came to, you know, doing what's right and wrong. And uh, I saw that movie and said, no way. And so second year of college, my advisor said to me, so what are you gonna major in? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, you have two weeks to decide. I said, what? I said, I don't know what I wanna do after I finish college. He said, well, what, what, what are you thinking? And I said, well, what are my options? And he gave me all these options and I thought, oh, okay. I was taking biology and chemistry. Um, I was taking English and languages. I was taking math and I was taking political science. And I thought, oh, I don't know what to do with any of this. And two weeks later, he said, okay, what are you gonna do? And I said, ultimately, well, I like law, medicine, I guess. I can do more law in medicine than I can do medicine if I become a lawyer. So I'm good with people, I like science, so I'll go to medical school. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I know that it was divine intervention because I had no understanding of what I was doing at that time. And uh, then went to NYU and pediatrics. That was another interesting thing when, when we had to decide what field to go into. I, um, I had done surgery first as a, as a third year medical student. I loved surgery, um, but I didn't like the hours and I didn't like the way surgeons necessarily behaved um, as people, at least what I was exposed to. Me too. And then, then I did internal medicine and I hated it. But because I went to NYU School of Medicine, there was this 
you know, you go to NYU School of Medicine, you go to surgery or you go to medicine. And I hated it. There was just nothing about it that I liked. And I even said in third year medical school, I said, what, what am I going to do for a 55 year old man who weighs 300 pounds, who smokes three packs of cigarettes a day, who doesn't want to change his diet and doesn't want to quit smoking? What am I going to do? Just up the medicine, change the medicine, add a medicine? And to me, even at that time, it seemed so like, I don't want to do that. Why would I want to do that? And then I did pediatrics and I just knew. Mm -hmm. And I had been a camper and a counselor and a head counselor for most of my life up until then. And uh, kids had always been a big part of my life. I was tutoring them. I was hanging out. I was really teaching them a lot uh, throughout the years. I loved being a counselor. I loved being a head counselor. And I always knew them. I always understood them. So by the time I uh, came to making a decision, um, after pediatrics, I did psychiatry, and then I did OBGYN. And even though I loved OBGYN, I didn't like the idea of getting up all the time the way obstetricians got up all the time. And so I picked pediatrics, and that was mm -hmm. sort of like, uh, of course, I wouldn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my residency in pediatrics, um, my father died suddenly, died in his sleep in the middle of my second year of residency. And that threw a big kink in the armor of what I wanted to do. Because originally my interest was to go into pediatric cardiology. And he passed away right at the time when you have to do your fellowship applications. And I just put everything on the back burner and said, you know, I'm lucky I'm getting up in the middle, you know, in the morning and going to work. Um, so I decided to delay it and I did my third year residency and I had nothing planned for the following year after residency. And I got a call about a fellowship program at back at NYU where I did medical school, where they were looking for someone to do a fellowship in the outpatient pediatrics department at Bellevue. And I said, sure. I interviewed and I took it. And during that year, well, during third year of residency and then during that year, uh, neonatology became my true love. And I thought that I would do neonatology and only do one year of this fellowship. And then I applied and got a position and turned it down. And the reason I turned it down is because I wasn't ready for it. And I really wanted to talk to kids more than just do neonates. Mm -hmm. So I ended up after one year of fellowship, I ended up getting offered a job in a pediatric emergency room in the Bronx. And so I took the summer of 1991 off when I finished my fellowship one year and I had no job. And then in the end of August, I got an offer for this emergency medicine job in the Bronx in New York at a nice salary and I took it. And so in October of 1991, um, after taking a couple of months off, the summer off, and then a couple of months more, I went and worked as a pediatric emergency room doc. And I kept that job for about four years. But during those four years, I also started working on the weekends for a pediatric private practice in Manhattan. Um, because I wasn't sure. I mean, everyone who saw me in, in my residency uh, said, oh, you're, you'd be a perfect pediatrician in, the, in private practice. And I just said, no, that's the last thing I want to do. Um, I just didn't want the hours. I didn't want the intensity of those hours. I was just, I was just shying away from it. And so I started to do weekend coverage of a private practice just to see if I can get my feet wet and get a flavor for it. And I somewhat liked it, but um, I was still torn between working in the ER, possibly doing neonatology again, and then the possibility of, of the uh, private practice. As it turned out, uh, I ended up being offered a job at another hospital in New York to run their pediatric intensive care unit. And I figured, well, this is safe for me. I know this. Uh, it was a step down unit. It wasn't a big time unit. Um, I was able to handle it, airway, breathing, circulation, first, you know, the ABCs of, of airway um, management. 
And uh, as part of the perk of being on staff there, I got to do five in-house calls per month covering the neonatal intensive care unit. So I got to do my neonatology, I got to go to deliveries, I got to take care of neonates and not have to do a full fellowship. And I loved it. I had a great time with it. And um, between four years in the pediatric emergency room and five years at Lenox Hill Hospital in the city, I got a lot of ER experience. I got a lot of intensive care unit experience. I took <laughs> care of newborns who were sick. I was intubating 500 gram babies, putting in UA lines and, and putting in IVs in these tiny babies and really taking care of them. Um, they were so sweet, so precious, and I loved it. I just loved it. Um, but something started to stir in those years when I was running the intensive care unit. And um, I had already started to learn about chiropractors and Chinese medicine and homeopaths and naturopaths and osteopaths and herbalists and homeopathy. Because what I was seeing in the emergency room, uh, there were just things that I, I couldn't understand in the ER. Like all these kids kept coming back for the same illness over and over and over again in the ER and I couldn't do anything to help them other than Here's your over-the-counter medicine. Here's your prescription for antibiotics. Here's your albuterol. Here's your steroids. Um, and here's your other prescription drugs. And I wanted to understand why these kids kept getting sick and how I can help them in a different way. And nothing in my Western medical training helped me in any way to understand what I could do to help them. And so as I started I met a nurse who was in acupuncture school. She referred me to a friend of mine, who, a woman who became a friend of mine, who gave me acupuncture, who then referred me to this chiropractor who I started asking questions about uh, chiropractic medicine and what it's all about. And then they connected me to a homeopath. And then I got connected to an acupuncturist and I started talking to him and learning from him and going to his office and watching him. And I just started to sop it up because it just seemed so new and so interesting. And um, I somehow wanted to figure out where Western medicine had all the same approaches that Chinese medicine does and Ayurvedic medicine does and chiropractic does and naturopathic does, homeopathy does. And I just kept searching. And then uh, eventually I found it uh, in the actual basic sciences, in the systems, in the neurology, in the, in the pulmonology, in the immunology, in the cardiology, in the gastroenterology, in the hematology, uh, in the neurology. It was all in there. And I was fascinated again by Western science. Um, Say more and, about how it's in there. I, I, our viewers may not make the connection as clearly well, as you have. Somewhere in the nine years that I was, um, you know, working in the ER and in the intensive care units, um, I started hearing from chiropractors and even acupuncturists, this idea that the body has the innate capacity to heal. And in eight years of medical school residency and fellowship, nah, I had no idea what, what that meant. The body has the innate capacity to heal. I mean, what is that? And so instead of just denying it and saying, no, 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 that's wrong. Western medicine is right and you're wrong. I started to look into it. And what I realized is that if we study the systems of the body, the neurology, the neuroimmunology, the neurobiology, the neurochemistry, if we study the pulmonology, the physiology of the lungs, the physiology of the heart, the kidney physiology, the blood hematology, the study of gastroenterology, the study of dermatology. What we find is that the body does have the innate capacity to heal and that there are unbelievable mechanisms built in into the neuroimmunology, into the immunology, into the neurology, into the autonomic nervous system, into the way the intestines work, 
into the way the lymph system works, the skin, the, every system has within it its known idea of how to make sure the body stays well. And it's built into Western medical language. Um, and so I started to understand. Uh, now say that, how is it built into Western medical language? Because Well, the, the body takes in air, for example. Mm -hmm. And there are many changes that happen in the sympathetic and, and parasympathetic nervous systems. And there are physiological changes that happen with inhalation. So there's a little bit of a jump of adrenaline when you take a breath in. And then when you exhale, there's a lowering of the adrenaline system and a raising of the parasympathetic nervous system, which then relaxes you. But in that relaxation is an expulsion of toxins and waves. And so when you eat your food, you're using some adrenaline to cook it and mash it and break it down. But then you're using your parasympathetic nervous system to digest it. And then once your digestive system has taken the pure stuff and separated it from the impure stuff, you hopefully absorb most of the pure stuff and you get rid of the impure stuff. And then when your body has reached a max of impurities, it has a nice parasympathetic response that then gets rid of toxins. So everywhere there is a balance of, of, of taking in material and making sure that the body gets rid of material so that the toxins and the wastes don't stay. Mm -hmm. And so it's already built in there. And, and if we look at all the ways in which the body gets sick, they're all meant to help the body detoxify. And it's, and it's run by the autonomic nervous system. So the sympathetic, and auto, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which are the equal and opposite ends of the autonomic nervous system, are really functioning all the time to make sure that the body stays well. And when there's too much toxins in us, we're gonna get vomiting parasympathetic, diarrhea parasympathetic, stools parasympathetic, urination parasympathetic, sweating and smelling parasympathetic, exhalation parasympathetic, mucus production parasympathetic. And if it gets over stimulated, there are too many wastes in the body then your parasympathetic nervous system is gonna make you cough. It'll make you vomit, it'll make you have diarrhea, it might give you a rash, it might make you uh, produce extra mucus, it might make you tear, it might make you feel malaise, it might make you sweat, it might make you urinate more. So the parasympathetic nervous system, when faced with a high amount of stress in the body, will do what it can to augment its ability to get rid of wastes. So in fact, the autonomic nervous system is built to help us stay well. And depending on where the system is in the body that you're most likely to exit those wastes is constitutionally based. So some people that'll be in the airways, they'll get rid of their junk through mucus and coughing and, and getting rid of it that way. Others might get it through the skin. Others might get it through the intestines. Others might get it through the kidneys. Others might get it through the tonsils and the adenoids and the upper airway. And others might get it through the nervous system. So there are many ways that the body will do all of what it can do to get rid of waste. So what I've come to understand after all my medical training is that an acute illness is actually the body's way of recreating homeostasis. It's actually the body's intelligent way to clean itself out of excess waste because cellular function won't work if there's excess wastes. And the fascinating part of that is that the hundred trillion or more microorganisms that are lining our bodies are part of the way in which we get rid of those wastes. So we are symbiotically related so well to these, these microorganisms, uh, which are not only helping us digest our food, they're helping us get rid of our wastes. 
and, and make sure that the body stays well. So in the journey to investigate all of these ideas in the other modalities and the other fields of medicine, I found it right in the basic science of the body. And um, it's, it's just fascinating to watch. And especially in kids, when you allow them to have their acute illness without putting more stress in them and without using over-the-counter medicines and without rushing to use prescription drugs, you'll almost always see a developmental growth spurt in the kids because the illness is meant to clean the body out, to prune the body mm. of excess wastes. And so now you have a really refined system that is ready to move forward. And parents see it. I mean, I used to see it when I was a kid and the doctors that I trained me in medical school and residency would teach this all the time. Hmm. That, you know, watch the kids if they are allowed to have their acute illnesses without suppressing them, with just supporting them with the right kinds of, of support. Um, they will have developmental growth spurts. And I see parents having it, those experiences all the time. Uh, unfortunately, there's this fear factor that parents have to run to the doctor and it's always an infection. It's never just the body doing what it's supposed to do. And so in my work, which I find so fascinating, is that I get to try to identify what are the stress levels or the stressors that are entering the body, that are pushing the kid over the threshold, creating so much waste and creating such an amount of inflammation that uh, the body has to get sick in order to clean itself out. Mm -hmm. And it's just fascinating to see it. And I've been practicing that way for over 20 years and uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of good education. Parents get it and kids really thrive when they're allowed to have their acute illnesses. Great. Well, thanks for the more detailed, what we're getting off your history into but a, a very important uh, component of, of what's influenced your whole practice. There's one uh, little side trip I'd like to take in the, all the, the alternative uh, treatments you've mentioned. The one that people have the most trouble with is homeopathy. Yeah. Um, What's your view? I, and I've always, I, it didn't particularly work for me, but I've seen it work with others. And I've always been on the fence about it. And then I saw a movie a few years ago that was very convincing, but I don't remember what it was in the, the movie. What, what do you think is behind homeopathy? Is it- oh, Homeopathy is, fasc it's a fascinating field to me um, because you, you have to use a different brain uh, approach. You can't use the same approach in Western medicine. It requires a, a turning of the, of the mind, a turning of the head to, to accept a new way of thinking. So this is how I understand homeopathy. The, de the, the way I understand it is like treats like. And uh, Dr. Hahnemann, uh, hundreds of years ago, noticed that if he took something in nature and overdosed on it, he would see a whole slew of symptoms. He would see skin symptoms, uh, body symptoms, lung symptoms, heart symptoms, skin symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, emotional symptoms, uh, left-sided symptoms, right-sided symptoms, daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms, things with warmth, thing with cold, uh, things with drying, things with heating. And he would take note of all of these fascinating side effects of what overdosing on things in nature would do to him and do to others. But then he started seeing people who presented with symptoms of illness that looked as if they also overdosed on those natural things in nature, even though the patients never touched those things. But for the most part, he would see that they looked like they might have overdosed on one of the plants or one of the elements in nature. 
And what he did was he said, okay, they look like they overdosed on belladonna. I'm going to give them a very, very, very small dilution of the belladonna. And I'm going to see if giving them a dilution of the thing that they look like they overdosed on, even though they didn't go near the plant, and I'm going to see if they get better. And so if he had somebody who had a high spiking fever with one cheek red and the other one not so red, and the hands and the feet were cold and the eyes were watery and the person looked a little delirious, he would say, wow, that person looks like he, do, he went to the plant and took too much belladonna. So he gave a very, 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 very dilute amount of it. And the person got better. And so what he realized is that there are symptoms that people can present with that actually match some of the elements of nature that if taken, in an overdose will look as if those symptoms were the same as whether, whether they overdosed or just got sick. And he started to take notes of all the things in nature and then started seeing patients who, if he gave dilutions of different remedies, would actually work for them. And so like treated like. So a child with teething who is screaming in anger, who is uncontrollably uh, not even paying attention, nothing will calm her down. But if you put something cold into the mouth and the, the kid chews on it, she might get some relief, will look like she might have overdosed on the chamomile plant. And if you give her a dilution of the chamomile, which may not even contain anything of the chamomile plant anymore. That's the part just, where people have trouble. Right, just the essence of it. Yeah. Then the child gets better because the child looks like she overdosed on chamomile plant, when in fact she presented with symptoms that were typical of teething, but giving a like remedy to a like set of symptoms actually made her better. And I know this is where I said people in Western medicine may have to suspend what they understand about the, the two-dimensional world, and that is that water actually carries information and water carries energy. And so um, if you don't believe it, you don't believe it. But if you do believe it, um, it really works. And uh, homeopathy in, in major settings can be life-saving for various sudden onset. Like, like if you had a kid who was fine one minute and all of a sudden out of nowhere, develops croup, a barking cough, then the, the remedy aconite can work like that because it's for any sudden onset of symptoms. And it usually works. Mm. It usually works. Um, well, let's get back to your history then. With, uh, did you start uh, practicing with any of these or did you work with other practitioners? Or how did you bring them into your, your practice? Um, some, some of the uh, remedies I, I took on and offered, but for the most part, um, I didn't want to become an acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to become a homeopath. I didn't want to become um, a, a, a naturopath. I didn't want to become a chiropractor. I wanted to teach the idea of these remedies to the families and let them know that there are other practitioners who could be part of their healthcare team. Mm -hmm. So I would be sort of the bridge. Like I, I, could under, I could explain to them things that 
Chinese medicine would better explain why the digestive system was suffering than I could explain it in Western medicine and then send them to the acupuncturist so that they would have already a prepared understanding of what they might be getting into. And then they would go and, and have their treatments. Um, and I would send for the constitutional homeopathic remedies, I would send them to the homeopath. I, I didn't want to study the depth of it. There was just too much information in my head. So you were in a solo practice at this point, or what was your... Yeah, by the uh, 2000. So after the four years of ER medicine, five years of intensive care medicine, neonatal, care, neonatal intensive care, inpatient pediatrics, and still doing the uh, private practice on weekends, um, I started to implement some of the um, more nutritional uh, uh, remedies that, that people could start using for, uh, for helping their children. And I started learning Reiki and I started doing Reiki and I started learning essential oils and I started using essential oils and I started learning herbs and I started using herbs and parents were interested and my philosophy was always, um, uh, the books say that this is supposed to work. Let's see if that helps your child because your child isn't always the book, so to speak. And the parents were willing to take the journey because as far as I knew, I wasn't doing anything that would hurt the kids. And by the year 2000, um, after nine years of ER and intensive care uh, medicine, uh, I started working in a private practice at the Beth Israel Center for Health and Healing, um, which was really one of the first of its kind, an integrative holistic center where we had psychologists, homeopaths, chiropractors, acupuncturists, family docs, pediatricians, um, psychiatrists, and nurse practitioners. Wow, I didn't um, know about that. Yeah, we had a we had a great great promise, and um, it was a lot of fun uh, at the beginning. And um, I stayed there for about two and a half years, and then took a sabbatical. I needed a break, uh -huh. and uh, but it was it was proof to me that I could do private practice, and that I actually enjoyed it. Um, but I burned out, you know, going from 1983 medical school, finishing four years of college, four year medical school, four years of training, four years of ER, five years of ICU, and then two and a half years of private practice, I, I burned out. So I took a break. I was already on the board of the American Holistic Medical Association, and I became president of the American Holistic Medical Association during the time when I was on sabbatical. And um, I took a little over two years off, which, in retrospect, was like, wow, how did I even do that? Um, and then uh, for the last 15 years, I have been in practice um, at the Northport Wellness Center in Northport, Long Island. And I am doing integrative, holistic pediatric medicine. And uh, I, I have fascinating families in my practice who are always willing to learn, willing to try new things, willing to parent differently, understand their kids differently, treat their kids differently, uh, feed their kids differently, um, and live differently. And uh, nutrition is the center point of my practice, as well as uh, parenting and spiritual uh, parenting. Um, nurturing you, the spirit of a child. Are you the only doc, or do you have a team, or what's your... Uh, I'm the only pediatrician. There's a pediatric nurse practitioner who has her own practice who works with me and uh, I teach her along the way. Um, but in the center where I work, it's owned and run by a chiropractor. We have a physiatrist in there. We have an acupuncturist. We have uh, trigger therapy. We have another chiropractor in there. There's a physical therapy office upstairs. There's psychotherapy in the building. And then we have affiliates. Uh, we have uh, practitioners who are off-site, who are part of the center uh, as affiliates, and they get referrals through us and, and bring referrals in. 
So we have quite an eclectic group of, of, of practitioners, um, optometrists, uh, mm -hmm. other physicians. We do hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It's quite, quite an interesting group of people and That's practitioners. Amazing. Now, what happened with the, uh, the, the BI group that you were with for two and a half years? Did that survive or you? Um, the, the BI, so it started in April of 2000. And um, I think it went for about 15, 16 years, maybe 17. Um, and uh, Mount Sinai Hospital uh, bought Beth Israel Medical Center. And as part of their purchase, I believe they closed the Beth Israel Center for Health and Healing. Mm -hmm. um, it had gone through different medical directors um, and different staff, but there were some people who were there for the whole time. Um, oh, yeah, we had a gynecologist, I forgot, who also was there um, doing integrative holistic uh, gynecology. And then little by little, you know, people left, other people came, and uh, people were finding their way. In, in the practice, but it has since closed. That's too bad because so many times the organizational challenges of keeping these idealized uh, systems running is a, a challenge. And my own wellness center, you know, with me as a manager, wasn't my cup of tea and trying to find other people to manage it uh, didn't work out. But I, I'm going to go back to when you first um, encountered the word holistic and, and what led to your joining the AHMA and uh, what kind of resistance you would have gotten from colleagues or support and what was the climate like back? I'm guessing uh, this was early 90s? Um, it was probably around the mid 90s, 1995, um, when I first started working at Lenox Hill Hospital. Um, I never understood the word holism until I started branching out and speaking to these other, other practitioners to learn about their crafts. Um, I never had holistic medicine on my mind. Um, mm -hmm. I never understood what holistic medicine was. In retrospect, in 1985, when I made the statement how could I go into medicine if I'm going to see a 55 year old man who's 300 pounds smoking three packs of cigarettes a day who won't change his diet and won't stop smoking? How can I help him? You know, I, I don't want to just up his meds or down his meds or change his meds. It doesn't feel uh, uh, congruent with what I want to do. And I had, I didn't realize, I didn't even know that, that I was actually speaking the beginnings of holistic medicine mm -hmm. um, uh, that I really wanted to work with getting to the root of what might be contributing to a person's state, uh, both in, bo in body, mind, and spirit. Um, but I, 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 it, it never occurred to me that that was holistic medicine until over 10, maybe 15 years later, um, when I just went, aha, now I get it. Um, but I, I just, in my search for trying to understand, well, what are the contributing factors that bring on a person's state of being? I already realized that I was doing holistic medicine and then I found a name to it. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't know it was that name until I started, you know, I think I got a, a flyer for a conference on holistic medicine. I'm like, what is that? I had no idea what that was. Um, I started to go to New York City meetings uh, with people who were doing holistic medicine because if, if there was anything that was very, very dear to me, it was uh, I, I, I wanted to learn what I didn't know. Like, even if it differed from what I thought I knew, I was always curious to know something new. When I meet people in my office, uh, if they come from a different culture or a different country, sometimes the first five, 10 minutes, I'm talking to them about their country, their culture, their food, because I think you get to know people a lot through yeah. their food and their cuisine and their customs. And because I want to know, you know, I want to know uh, more. I want to learn more about what makes them live in their house and, and how they view parenting and children and diet and 
and you know uh, lifestyle. And I think it's it's a warm way to welcome people in, but it's also my curiosity. Um, how? Tell me more. Tell me what I don't know. And what I saw in Western medicine, unfortunately, was this: um, only what we know is what there is to know. And that saddened me, because in my in my investigation in you know I don't know what I don't know. I found I could increase the size of the box that I lived in. Mm -hmm. There's so many other things that can add to what I can understand and what I can help others understand is, is, is uh, contributing to what's going on in their life. And then I started learning about all these ideas of consciousness. You know, it, you do the diet, you do the supplements, you do the homeopathy, you do the herbs, you do the craniosacral therapy and the osteopathy and, you know, the homeopathy and the chiropractic. And you do all that body stuff. And then I started to realize, whoa, how do I get to the emotional? And then how do I get to the spiritual? And how do I get to the layers of, of, of patterns that are running underneath, that are driving people to behave the way they behave. And as I started asking those questions, I started asking those questions on myself. And so I started really having to dig deeply into my own patterns and my own psyche and my own subconscious. And wow, what a ride. Was this during your uh, sabbatical? Oh, um, I think it escalated during the sabbatical, but um, it, it has been nonstop. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't say this lightly, but for anyone who's on a path of, of healing uh, or on a journey towards um, growth, um, you're always, <laughs> always digging yeah. in to these layers. Um, and sometimes not so fun, um, and sometimes some fun, but um, the, the resolution of some of the things are, are so exciting, really, really so exciting. And I try to do that with some of the parents as well, because they're looking to understand how some of their wounds are impacting why they're having difficulty with their kids and how their parenting is based on those wounds and how the children are, are suffering because of that and how they're willing to actually be more conscious of it and see if they can get the, the changes they're going to help them be better adults and better parents because if there's anything that i've learned is that children don't learn because you tell them what's true children learn because you behave yeah and they they model predominantly who you are and what you do and uh it's your your job. They're, they're great at detecting your shadow and reflecting it back to you Oh, they are video cameras. And if there's a parent that hasn't been thrown under the bus, I want to meet who that parent is. <laughs> because every child will throw a parent under the bus because they're honest. They're so yeah. honest. And I love it. That's one of the reasons I love being with kids because I like to in, in, embrace and empower their honesty because their authentic self is very strong. I'm reminded of the uh, statement, uh, the truth will set you free, but first it may piss you off. That's right. That's right. I'm also thinking uh, on another a colleague of mine who I interviewed, Robin Grill, his wonderful book called uh, <clears throat> Inner Child Journeys, which is all about the fact that your children are reflecting your shadow and your own wounds. And if you use them as mirrors and heal your own stuff, it will benefit them. It's, it's a brilliant piece Correct. of work. I mean, it's, it sounds very profound. It sounds pretty simple, but it, it's also very profound and because- For our, our culture. Right, but, but I'm grateful that I have work with parents where they're willing to actually look at themselves and improve. And when they do that, they see the children shift right mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Wanted to get back again to a little more of the history of uh, when you first went to an AHMA meeting and how you got into the inner circle of that. Uh, do you remember? Well, as I said, I think 
somewhere in between 1995, 97, I may have gone to a couple of New York City chapters mm -hmm. of the AHMA. Um, I remember meeting a couple of people who became influential later on. Um, but who were they? Um, one, one gentleman was Alan Warshawski. I remember meeting him very early on uh, in the mid 90s, late, you know, early to mid, uh, after 1995, I think it was. And I remember um, really hitting it off with him. And he's actually the OBGYN who came to work at the Center for Health and Healing in 2000 with Beth Israel. And we re, re reconnected at that time. But there were a couple of just, I, I, they were very vague to me. I don't remember them specifically in the mid to late 90s. Um, but I started to become interested and I'd look. I, I, I think I might have gone to one conference, but as soon as I became a pediatrician at the Center for Health and Healing, um, I got much more involved in the AHMA. And, or maybe like the year before, like 1999, 2000. And then, you know, when you speak up and you have a lot of uh, opinions and you sound like you might know what you're talking about, people want you to be included and they like your passion and they like your energy. And, and so I think by 2001 or two, I was already elected onto the board. And uh, by 2003, I was president. So mm -hmm. it happened very quickly. Um, it was a great experience for me, a tough one, because, you know, being in a position of leadership, um, you know, comes with um, lots of pros and cons. And, and I was young. I was so young at that time. I was just in my late 30s, early 40s. And, you know, I, I wish I had the wisdom now uh, back then, because, you know, I would have undone a lot of the things that I did, or some of the things that I did, um, or built different relationships. But um, yeah, I think I was, I was on, I was involved with the HMA, probably until about 2007, um, where I stayed on as past president, and then a little bit longer and then and then went my separate ways. I also had the privilege and pleasure of teaching at the American Board of Holistic Medicine conference, I think starting in 02, 02, 03, 04, somewhere around there. And I, I did that for a number of years until 2007 as well. And so, um, you know, I got to really um, uh, hone my craft in teaching and being in front of medical doctors. And uh, we I ran a conference with a colleague of mine for the HMA on women and children's health, which was really a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I, I enjoyed my time, you know, and my growth in, in that organization. So you haven't stayed connected with the new academy and uh, the transition to the... No, I... I I had um, I had board certified it with the American Board of Holistic Medicine, and, and then when the AHMA disbanded and the A A B H M became the A B I H M, um, I, my interests changed and my community changed, so I, I started to go off in different ways. Um, you know, I, I I was willing to tackle some very, very controversial subjects in pediatrics that um, there were many in the group that, that weren't at the time wanting to tackle. And so I, I went off in separate ways to, to continue to do that work and raise awareness and scientific questions regarding uh, vaccines and vaccinations and vaccine injury and vaccine safety. And so it, it was just a meeting of the minds where, you know, they wanted to go off in one direction and, and I felt that I was going to continue going off in uh, my direction. I'd like to explore that more with you uh, when we wrap up the history, because I think this, you're a wealth of information on that too. And uh, 
I'll, I'll keep that as a separate recording. So uh, now just to uh, take the next stage in your, your history, you, you've now uh, been with the, is it North? What? North Port Wellness Center. North Port. Well, how, how many years? 15 years? Did you 15, say? yeah. And uh, it's still going strong. Are you uh, saddled with a lot of administrative uh, duties or do you have that well handled? Or Well, <laughs> I, I have to say that it's the least favorite part of my practice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I made a choice in 2002 when I left the Beth Israel Center for Health and Healing that I was not going to participate in insurance programs anymore. Mm -hmm. So when I started back in February of 05 at the Northport Wellness Center, uh, I did not take any insurance. And now you're the founder of that. I'm the founder of my practice, but not the Northport Wellness Center. Oh, Northport okay. Wellness Center is founded by a chiropractor. That's right. You mentioned a, a chiropractor. Yeah. Right. Uh, I want to to uh, jump back way back to uh, your your childhood. I I didn't catch if you had siblings or what your parents did. Were you, uh, so, what? so I I um I have an older sister who's six years older than I am, and uh, I had a brother who was uh, trisomy twenty one Down syndrome. Mm -hmm who was born in June, December of 1959 and who passed away a uh, crib death in June of 1960. And uh, I was conceived in November of 1960, five months later. Mm. And uh, so uh, I, I definitely uh, had an affinity my whole life for children with special needs and especially children with trisomy 21 um, and I didn't understand why I had such an affinity when I was a teenager and a counselor and a head counselor, mm. Be, you know, cause I hadn't been doing this more of the spiritual work. And then I realized what happens when a, 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 a fetus is uh, growing in an emotional environment of, of the death of a baby who just died five months before I was conceived. Mm. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I've gotten to really understand uh, on a very visceral level, the impact that the emotional state of a mother can have on her growing fetus and, and how that is, how that is uh, um, put on to the emotional body of the unborn and then born child. But I, I, I always had an affinity. Um, and interesting, I didn't, I didn't know that I had a brother until I was maybe eight or eight, eight years old, where one of my friends said, hey, Larry, my sister said you had a brother who died. I was like, what? What? Like, what? <laughs> Hello? What? what? So, of course, I went up to my parents and, I, you know, I was a little whippersnapper of a kid and I just said, uh, excuse me, uh, what's this about? How did they handle that? Well, they were nervous because, uh, you know, they obviously didn't want me to find out in the schoolyard, you know, or downstairs with my friends. But, you know, they explained it to me and I listened and, um, you know, I asked probably one of the most profound questions looking back that I think I've ever asked in my life, which is I looked at my parents, I'm all of eight years old, and I looked at them and I said, would you have had me if he had lived? Mm. And it only, I only realized that that was a profound question years later when I shared the question with people and they would, sort of give me feedback on what that question, you know, what kind of uh, astute child I might have been in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, because there was a part of me that didn't, at the time that I asked the question, there was a part of me that didn't think that I would have been born. Mm -hmm. Like there were really, had he lived, I might not have been conceived. Um, because I really felt like a replacement child. And once I knew that he was there and had died, 
my life started to become more understandable because I always had this deep sense of like I was there to replace or I was there to fit into something. Um, and then once I found that out and then did some of the deeper, you know, you know shadow work, um, it's like, wow, what an astute thing for an eight year old to say to his parents yeah. um, at that time. So. so was your mom a stay at home mom or? Did, did my, you... my father was a grocer. Um, he grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. His parents were immigrants from Belarus, uh, probably one of the shtetls in Eastern Europe. And um, uh, his father came over in like 1902, 1901, 1903. Mm -hmm. And his mother came over, I think in 1911, 1912. And uh, they were first cousins, uh, my father's parents. and. Uh, they came to Ellis Island and, you know, settled into the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And uh, my father was one of six kids. He was the only boy. He lost a brother who had uh, died of a head injury falling down the stairs to the store where my grandfather worked. Um, so uh, he was the only boy of, and five sisters. And um, my father, um, ended up having um, a partial amputation of his right leg when he was three and a half from, um, from an accident. He was holding his mother's hand ready to cross the street and he took a step forward and a truck went over his right foot. And at that time, gangrene set in and they, they amputated below his right knee. So uh, he lived most of his, you know, almost all of his life with, uh, with a wooden leg. So he was a grocer. He worked in my grandfather's grocery store. And then when he was old and older and wanted to go out on his own, he continued in that business. And um, my mother was a legal secretary uh, on and off during my childhood. Sometimes she was home, sometimes she was working. And uh, she remained a legal secretary after my father passed. Um, and uh, my sister, my sister went to a two-year community college and uh, she became a legal secretary at some point. Now she manages uh, a temple on Long Island. She's an office manager. And somehow I went to four-year college, four-year medical school and became a doctor. So I have no idea how any of that happened. Well, I do have ideas, but um, I'll leave it for another conversation. Did you get scholarships or in, uh, uh my my father's grocery business failed uh, due to family strife uh, while I was still in high school, junior high school and high school. So by the time I went to college, my father had been out of work for a couple of years. So I got a lot of grants and scholarships to go to college. And I got um, a couple of loans. But for the most part, I was very fortunate. Uh, I really feel like I was being guided and protected in those years mm. because I went to a really good school without really much money. Um, and then when I went to medical school, um, that was mostly loans and grants and scholarships. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons that I took that extra job on the weekend uh, when I was working as an ER doc and then in, in running the intensive care unit was because I really wanted to pay my loans off. And mm -hmm. so I finished my training in 1991 and I finished paying off my loans in 1995. Pretty good. Yeah, very fast because I, I made good money working on the weekends. I made good money in the ER. I was really hustling and my loan repayment term was all the way to 2000, uh, January of 2002, I think. Mm. And I paid it off seven years early. Great. I wanted it done. I wanted it done. Now, did you have any time here for relationships and kids of your own? Uh, what, uh, no, I'm single. I've been, uh, I've been a free spirit almost my whole life. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well. But yeah. I like to say that I'm a father and an uncle to thousands of kids. Sure. And I have very special relationships 
with a lot of kids. And it got to a point, Jack, where I actually started to feel like I was a father to the parents, mm -hmm. which really, really built a very different relationship in the office. Um, and, you know, part of the inner journey, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I've come to discover in the inner work and the shadow work is that I, I sort of believe that we go through our childhoods missing something mm -hmm. for just about everybody. And that if there's a design or a game to play, the game is that uh, we are supposed to miss things from our parents in childhood so that we can then develop the ability to be our own mother and father to ourselves. And if there's anything that, that being a pediatrician, doing the shadow work, doing the spiritual work has, has shown me um, is how important it is to develop the ability to be the father and mother to yourself that may have created some of the wounds and the scars in the first place. Well, that brings me right to an, another area of our uh, uh, conjoined interests of when in the early 90s, uh, a woman who had been on our board had kept telling me, you got to read the continuum concept. And, oh, yeah. You know, just couldn't get around the name, whatever. Finally, I got a copy out of the library and I read it. Jean Leadloff's the author and, and got depressed for two weeks. Mm. And I didn't realize I was reading the first edition. In the second edition, she had a note in the preface about why not to be depressed that you weren't the only person in Western civilization to, to be raised connectedly. Right. So um, at, at that time, we were also contemplating having a child. I had a daughter that was 20 years old at that point and for my first marriage. And reading that and then learning about the Sears and attachment parenting and a whole different approach to connected, what, what we later call connection parenting, uh, it was like, wow, what a difference. And thinking that that could change what had been a horrible experience for me of separating when my daughter was two and a half, you know, 15 years earlier, um, it uh, shifted my career from adult wellness to infant wellness. And yeah. we founded the uh, uh, Alliance for Transforming the Lives <clears throat> lives of Children. I met Suzanne Arms, who had written oh, nice. uh, um, Immaculate Deception back in 75, mm -hmm. uh, same year that um, Leadloff's book came out, <laughs> and Joe, Joe Pierce's um, Magical Child, uh, I think mm -hmm. that was 76. I had avoided all that because of my discomfort with having kids or having a child and, and mm -hmm. my own wounding. So that became my career focus for many years. In fact, that might have been how I tracked you down. I, I was after people for our board of advisors. I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I do believe that how we're raising kids in Western culture with uh, um, detachment parenting or coercive parenting and not having that skin to skin connection uh, they first, I, I interviewed uh, Phyllis Klaus the other day and how they discovered doulas and their original work was looking at breastfeeding and bonding and accidentally one of their research assistants performed the doula role unknown to them and they saw it in the statistics when they were analyzing it and tried to figure out well, what, what happened with these mothers and discovered this assistant who was supposed to just be there to get permission for the study had stayed in the room during the delivery and acted as a doula. Right. And I remember Marshall saying, you know, if this were a drug, everyone would have it. The results sure. are sure, sure. amazing. Yeah. So, uh, that connection uh, to me, and uh, uh, I was curious with the neonatal, I, I ran into Niels Bergman in South Africa and uh, with kangaroo care, and that was intriguing to me, the uh, um, connection even with preemies. Uh, uh -huh. uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, what? Well, I, again, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just take it. I'll take it from one perspective because there's so many perspectives to go through here. But um, I, I think I think it's important for us to remember that human babies are the least neurologically developed of any mammal mm -hmm. uh, upon birth, 
And as a result of that, they need a lot of care because they're pretty much helpless. Um, there's, almost, there's nothing that a, a newborn can do for him or herself at all. And the, the baby doesn't know the, the developmental concept called object permanence. Like I'm sitting here, I know my sister is there. I know that my friends are in the office. I know that, you know, uh, people I'm going to see tonight and tomorrow are where they are. But if a baby doesn't feel you, smell you, touch you, sense you, a baby doesn't know that you exist. Mm -hmm. And so that can be very catastrophic to the nervous system that is completely helpless. And so the idea of teaching parents to connect to their kids seems strange to me because it, why wouldn't you? It's, it's inherently necessary for the baby to thrive. And you can't spoil a baby by holding the baby and attending to the baby's needs. Now that doesn't mean that you don't put a baby down. Of course you can put a baby down. But when a baby squirms or starts to cry, that baby is not believing it is protected. And so needs connection. And connection can be a smell, can be a touch, can be a song, can be a voice, can be a whisper, can be picking up, can be fed, um, can be changed, talked to. You know, there are so many ways to connect to a child. Um, when I hear doctors telling parents, it's time to sleep train your child, oh. my head starts to go 360 around my neck. Like, so I look at the parent and I say the following, Jack. Let me paint this scenario for you. You're in your room. You start crying. You don't have any idea where anything is. But you know your loved ones are on the other side of that door. How would you feel if they don't come in and see what's going on. Well, and you don't even know that they're on the other side of the door at, at the earliest stage. Right, but I'm saying it to an adult. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Like, I'm saying it to an adult. You, yeah. How do you feel if you're an adult? You, you have faculties, you have abilities to soothe, and you're crying hysterically, and all your loved ones are on the other side of the door. And they, inside, they're saying to themselves, okay, he's going to have to just cry it out and figure it out himself at two months, at three months, at four months, at six months, at eight months, at two years. So I think, I think there's a way for us to teach connection without it being consumption and without it being cumbersome or even abandoning. There's just a way to say, I know, I understand, I'm right here, I hear you, I love you, it's time to go back to bed, I'm with you, you're safe. You know, words of connection. I mean, those are real words of connection. Uh, I'm right here. I know. I understand. I know you're scared. I know it's dark. I'm right here. I love you. I'm tired too. Uh, it's time for us to go to bed. You know, something that lets the kid go, oh, 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 okay. Whew. Good. I, I, I'm not helpless. I'm not pathetic. I'm, I'm actually connected. And one of the things that I have seen over the years in dealing with uh, 
habits, addictions, is that, is that we can teach parents to not use foods, liquids, or habits to connect to kids to make them feel better. Because that's not real connection. That's not heart connection, that's objectification connection. It's not really connection. So, so what I try to do is, is encourage parents to shift the object that they're trying to use to soothe the child to themselves as the person who soothes the child. So that the child learns that in times of distress, it's the connection that makes the child feel alive and calm. So that when the child is 19 and is upset and can't settle down, he doesn't choose heroin or alcohol or food or sex or work or high-speed cars or all these things that are objectifications of things to see if that can make them feel better. Now, I'm not saying that not connecting to your infant is the root cause of addictions. What I'm saying is that it may be a piece of what signals the chemistry of the child's brain to want to utilize an object for soothing because they don't have a memory of connection mm -hmm. to person as soothing. And it's a lot of fun, you know, because parents, when I start to show parents what connection looks like in the office, rather than a rattle or a, or a bottle or a food or a drink or a breast or, yeah. you know, a, a toy, they start to realize that the child will soothe with connection. But it requires the parent to be able to sit with the discomfort that the parent has, as well as the discomfort that the child has. And so the coming together of the heart connection actually creates mm -hmm. the soothing. And it's beautiful to watch. And it's wonderful when the parent can take whatever wounds and old stories about, I have to make it better, I have to make it better, I can't let my kid cry, to, well, you know, we can actually sit with this for a little bit and watch to see if connection really will make a difference. And it almost always does. Yeah. Well, I, I'd go further and say, I think. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to play with that. I love that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I met Jim Prescott around the same time in uh, 96. And uh, he'd done the research at NIH and, and learned that the three primary or close senses are touch, uh, scent, and movement. Right. And we don't even count movement as one of the five senses. And it's the first one. It's what you experience, you know, from when you're a tiny embryo. Right. And, and you've been jostled around in the womb for nine months and suddenly you're still in a, in a crib. Like, mm -hmm. that's pretty awful just in itself. Correct. So, and, and we've got the whole obstetrical model of separation. <sighs> denies the mother-baby unit. Uh, you know, so you've, you've got that. And cutting the cord too soon until yeah. the stops. Yeah. The cord. And uh, I, I do believe that uh, even clamping the cord, like that squeezing that last bit of blood out of the, of the uh, placenta, you know, that was designed to be in the baby. <laughs> I agree. They're, uh, you know, they're anemic when they're born. Like, so you've got that on top of the uh, other... Uh, Emmett Miller wrote a wonderful piece called Delivery Room Football when his daughter was born and they tried to take her away and he physically blocked the nurses. <laughs> he yeah. describes it like a football move <laughs> that, nope, you're not taking her out of here. And he held on to her. Right. I, probably I, I want to tell you a funny story. Um, I think it was either November of 97 or November of 98. I did a weekend away uh, sort of a holistic weekend out in the eastern part of Long Island. Uh, there was a yoga person there. There were a couple of medical doctors there. There was a Reiki practitioner there, meditation. And um, I met this woman who, 
who was a Reiki master. And I was intrigued. I'm like, what is this? You know, instead of saying, oh, that's nonsense, that's woo woo, mm -hmm. I just leaned in and I was like, what, what is this all about? Help me understand this. And so I, I trained Reiki one and Reiki two with her. Uh, her name is Pamela Miles. And um, I started to use Reiki in the delivery room. Because uh, one of my responsibilities was to go to the DR, the delivery room, when there was a high-risk pregnancy or they needed a pediatrician at mm -hmm. the birth um, because they were concerned about some distress in the, in, the, in the fetus. And so I would go and it wasn't uncommon for the baby to come out flaccid, you know, completely out of it. Mm -hmm. No tone, uh, no movement, eyes weren't open. And, you know, previously I was trained to turn on the light and rub the baby and pat the baby and smack the baby and put the oxygen over the face and just hyper stimulate the baby to get the baby to wake up. And once I learned Reiki, I, I thought to myself, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. And I, I, what do I have to lose? I know airway. I know breathing. I know circulation, A, B, C. Right? So if a newborn baby comes out, I have to make sure the airway is open. I have to make sure there's air passing through the airway. And I have to make sure the heart rate is above 100. And so that's what I would do. Even if the baby was flat on his or her back. And once I did those three things, airway, breathing, circulation, I turned the light off from the incubator. I put the oxygen mask on the chest. So it was spraying right into the baby's face. And the baby could be tachypnic. The baby could be uh, uh, labored breathing. But as long as the heart rate was up and as long as the air was moving, I turned the light off, put the oxygen on, put one hand under the head, and one hand under the chest. And I did Reiki. And anyone who came near the baby, who was attempting to stimulate the baby, I would push away. Either I would snarl at them with a look, or I would very quietly say, please don't touch the baby. And you'd watch these nurses and nurse practitioners kind of looking at me like, oh my God, what is he doing? <laughs> and slowly but surely, Jack, I would watch these babies be born in my hands. Wow. Because I let the circulation work itself out. And I don't know if it was the Reiki or just airway breathing circulation and let's give you a chance to reverse your acidosis right, to improve your circulation, to oxygenate your blood, and to get your tone. And all of a sudden, the babies, I would watch them, Jack, it was absolutely fantastic. This is, I started doing this in 98, I think it was definitely 98. And the babies first, they, their eyes would flicker, and then they'd start to, you know, flick their tongue, and then their arms would start to move, and, you know, and their legs would come up and then their arms would bend. So the tone was starting to come up and then they would open their eyes and just look up. And I would reach down because I know babies can't see less than about an inch away from their eyes just when they're born. And I would say, hi, happy birthday. And I would very gently dry the baby off, wrap the baby up, hand the baby to the mother, and say, congratulations. Mm -hmm. And the, the obstetrician, who was worried, because they're not hearing any crying, would say, how's the baby, doctor? How's the baby? 
And I'd say, the baby is waking up. Because mm. I would have my back to the obstetrician and the mother. And I would just do this. Well, let me tell you something. I can't tell you the number of babies I prevented from going to the neonatal ICU. Mm. Because all these babies would have been grunting and gasping for air uh, because they were acidotic. And they weren't given the chance to stabilize with a little oxygen and a little time and not being overstimulated. And certainly um, people were happy that the babies were happy and well, but they were pissed at me because I was doing this in the middle of a New York City hospital where numbers are important and you're, you're what are you doing? This isn't medicine. And when I did it to my boss's nephew, who I prevented from going to the intensive care unit, he literally looked at me and said, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what you did. And he just put his hand up. I don't want to know. I said, but, but I kept him from going to the neonatal ICU. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. So, you know, and there was a time when I had a girl in my intensive care unit who had a rod put in for scoliosis. And uh, she, they called me because she wanted pain meds quicker than what was on the order. And I went over to her and I said, are you okay if I put my hands on you? And she said, fine. And I put my hands on her and I kept talking to her and she fell asleep. Mm. And I don't know if Reiki did it, but I know something changed. And... She didn't get her meds until when it was time uh, later on. Mm -hmm. So I was fascinated by that. And the thing is, is that I was okay with not understanding it all, but I certainly wanted to understand it because my mind was like, help me understand what this is about. This is fascinating to me. Um, needless to say, you know, I ended up leaving Lenox Hill to go to Beth Israel, um, which, which actually was mutually uh, positive for all sides because, you know, I don't think they wanted to keep, you know, me uh, doing stuff like that in the hospital. Too this, bad that it, it doesn't get recognized for what it is and, and cost savings, not to mention the connection savings that it's... When I have my hospital, Jack, I'll do it in my hospital. Okay. And that's still on your, in your plan? Well, you know, I'm open to what the universe has in store for me. I, I, I can definitely write it down, but uh, it, it may not be in the plans. There may be something else that I uh -huh. have to be open to. Well, in wrapping up your, your personal history, uh, I'm delighted we've covered so many different areas. I'd like to uh, see if you have any closing um, comments, uh, words of wisdom for future generations that we hope will get benefit from uh, learning about you? Oh. Um, well, if there's anything that I want to share, if, if it hasn't been a common theme, if, if it hasn't been obvious what the common theme is and what I've been, what I've been saying this time is that um, I'm be curious. Um, recognize that Western medicine is really fantastic for so many life-saving and life-changing things. But there's more to life than just what Western medicine can offer. And let's not forget the mind. Let's not forget the heart. And let's not forget the spirit of the people on whom we're, we have the privilege of caring for their lives. And um, I, I, would, I would hope that future generations would be, would be inquisitive, would be curious, uh, would be willing to say, I don't know what I don't know, uh, would be humble enough to learn new things and expand their horizons beyond what they think they know to be true. And uh, Western medicine uh, is part of the major aspects, Jack, of my medical training. Western medicine holds dear the method called the scientific method which means uh, make an observation and don't be afraid to ask questions. And don't be afraid that when you ask questions, you might get answers that are different from what you might have expected. 
And I love the scientific method. I adhere to the scientific method all the time. Um, I always find curiosity in the things that I do when I practice. Um, and um, be critical in your thinking. Go outside of what you think you know and expand your horizons. We need, we need healers who are going to be able to listen to people's experiences and be open to it, even if it contradicts what the medical books say to be true. Because experience is what we're taught when we're pediatricians. Listen to the mothers, they know their kids, even if it doesn't make sense to what you thought you knew to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, be open to the possibility that the experiences that parents have may not necessarily agree with the science that you were told to be true. And don't be afraid to question the science that you were told to be true. I'm reminded of Bill Manahan's distinction between fast medicine that allopathic medicine is really good at with acute situations and a total failure with slow medicine, which is the connection to what you're describing. And uh, mm -hmm. that distinction, uh, I had never heard it before Bill described it, and mm -hmm. it just s made such com uh, great sense. So, yeah. well, I thank you for this wonderful history of your uh, who you are and why, and uh, let's wrap this up. And then I'd like to, uh, if you can hang on a little longer, go into a, a special area I think we're both interested in of the, the current uh, vaccine issue and uh, particularly with the uh, COVID vaccine that is people are believing is going to make everything all okay. So thank you. Let's, uh, I'll end the recording and uh, um,